Mr. Plavrakis, what are some of the biggest hurdles on the road to decarbonization? Well, um, the magnitude of the problem, first of all, it's, it's immense. Uh, we all know what we have to deal with right now. And uh, although the industry has become more aware and more mature uh, related to the issues that are, um, are going to be uh, impacting uh, the industry and, uh, and are going to be uh, driven by the decarbonization narrative, there's still a number of unknowns and um, there are things that are currently dynamic and moving, uh, taking shape, such as specific regulations, such as uh, gaps in uh, standardization uh, that could inform decisions. We talked about earlier in the morning about fuels and alternative fuels and uh, low carbon or carbon neutral fuels. All these colors that uh, uh, the industry is discussing about, green, blue, gray, um, how can you assess those? What are the uh, instruments that are available for us to make informed decisions with regards to the final carbon footprint? These carbon economics and carbon accounting narrative and common language is not there yet. So we lack that. Um, the other thing that uh, we, we, we seem to be um, uh, lacking is uh, a way forward with regards to the evolu evolution and the development of the value chains. We're talking now about a value chain game when we're talking about energy transition. It's not just the ship, it's the value chain that the ship is active in. Um, and uh, we, we have very frequently discussed as ABS about the two major value chains, the hydrogen and the carbon capture value chain. How far are we as far as uh, the elements that need to take place uh, within that value chain to achieve the next decarbonization target and next decarbonization milestone? We are now start, starting talking about critical resources, resources that will be necessary for the scaling up, for the launching of new products, for the uh, uh, availability of the alternative fuels, the production of those, the distribution, the storage, um, the uh, distribution and storage of CO2 when that is captured. These are things, pieces in the puzzle that are either missing or are in development. Um, as we map this out, I think that we will get more clarity and more acceleration towards the decarbonization future that we all hope for. Given the uncertainty on fuels, how can shipping companies renew their fleets? I think we did mention that in the beginning uh, of, of this uh, uh, conference in one of the panels that there are points uh, of uh, uh, starting points where uh, ship owners can actually look into and see whether it, it can apply on their, in their case. And of course, I did emphasize that not one uh, size fits all as far as the uh, energy molecules are concerned, as the fueling uh, uh, question is concerned. But we see that there are already mature technologies and technologies in development. LNG and methanol, for example, are two fuels that have been already part of our uh, fuel ecosystem and they're gaining momentum. We see lately uh, a lot of interest around methanol and uh, we're now fleshing out how methanol can be produced in a more sustainable way and in a more scalable way and that's things that are also in development. And we see that in the mid-term to long-term future we are going to have also the zero carbon fuels that uh, the industry is, is looking into as solutions such as ammonia for example. Um, but preparing for this type of fuel, starting from the ones that are mature right now, is one way to go about it. Um, there is also um, development in the life cycle part from the regulations. Uh, there is also development in how uh, we address uh, the aspect of biofuels from a unified interpretation point of view. So I think that there are instruments and tools that the ship owner can now use in order to inform uh, their strategy around how new ships should be built.